the end and I'll just um, say a few words of introduction here before we get started. First of all, thank you for for coming on um, in a timely manner so that we can work all these kinks out as we um, move into this phase of virtual committee meetings. Um, Want to make sure that we are being um, uh, extra careful to make sure that people are able to ask questions and are able to participate in the same way they would be if they were in the room with us at the state house. Um, and so uh, moving forward, we are heading into uncharted territory and I will be the first to admit that I'm completely new at this. And, um, and so I would welcome you to make requests of me if you think that things need to slow down or speed up or be done in a different manner or be um, open to public participation in some other way. I'm happy to have that conversation because I think it's very important that uh, that we figure out how, how to um, how to do this governing that we need to do and do it in a way that ensures um, public safety by not uh, not putting us in the same room together. Uh, so uh, please be um, you know be open and feel free to reach out to me directly if you have um, questions or suggestions or concerns. Um, so when we had a chair's discussion um, with the leadership team, I can't even remember what day it was because the days are all sort of running together and nights as well. <laughs> um, we had talked about thinking of our workload right now in sort of four different phases. Number one phase was that let's get these immediate emergency response uh, bills through the House and the Senate and to the governor's desk. Um, that is the workload that was contained in those packages that we moved yesterday. Um, the second bud, uh, bucket or the second sort of um, level of priority is, was there anything that committees were teed up and ready to do um, during that last week before crossover uh, when we put a stop to basically everything in order to concentrate on developing our COVID-19 response. Um, and so, you know, anything that was teed up and ready to move pre-crossover. Uh, the third bucket is what is the next phase of emergency response that might fall within the jurisdiction of our committee? So are there other things that we hear from our municipal government, from our, uh, from our schools, from, uh, from uh, different agencies of state government who might also need um, some change to statute in order to allow them to continue um, operations and or shift operations into a remote realm. So I'm going to ask you to keep your eyes and ears open for those um, and funnel those in uh, so that we can be keeping tabs on them. Um, and, you know, at some point, the return to normalcy will, will hopefully mean that we can sit down and and, and sort of map out an agenda that that goes, you know, a couple of days um, uh, ahead of time, so that we've got an agenda put together and people can uh, can take a look at it ahead of time. Right now, um, I think we're still trying to get into the swing of things and haven't had a chance to to really do that pre-planning um, in the way that we would if we were in a normal state house setting. Um, so. The third bucket being those other emergency or midterm response things that we need to look at. And I'll just flag one of the issues that we had left out of the, the elections part of the COVID-19 uh, was this sort of discomfort that people have with the idea that because there are no petition signatures required that all of a sudden, you know, there's uh, much less of a barrier or a hurdle for, for people to get over if they want to legitimately run for office? And is that a concern enough that that makes us want to pursue some other way? And um, and so that's a question mark. And, and I know that that's one that we don't have to figure out immediately, but just so that you kind of frame that in, in as one of the mid term response um, that we might need to make. And then the fourth bucket um, or, or the fourth priority of things is, you know, what were we planning to do post crossover? And so the, the, we, we had talked a bit about a, 
a few things that we wanted to do post crossover with bills that you know, maybe adding some language to bills that were coming from the Senate. Um, and we don't know right now what is going to, to continue to come to us from a Senate based on uh, the fact that everybody's putting everything in a timeout and, um, and it's a little uncertain what we're gonna see from them. Warren, you've got your hand up. Yes, uh, I just wanted to mention that at least four times during the last couple of minutes that you've been talking, your, the, the video has frozen and audio as well. It lasts for about three to five seconds and then it catches back up with you. I don't know if Tony has any idea what might be causing that, but you know, uh, we have um, That's times. a limitation of internet bandwidth. That's where basically the internet's kind of clogging up and catching up. Yep, well, unfortunately, our chair goes out in the boonies. <laughs> yeah, well, unfortunately there's nothing we can do about that. We're literally okay. seeing record traffic on the internet these days. Okay. Well, part of there, the problem could be that my husband is sitting in the next room on a conference call with his company, um, but he told me he's he's done with that call at two thirty. So hopefully it'll get better. <laughs> okay. I apologize. Um, well, if no, if it's it, no big, I just wanted to make sure you knew. Yep. Yeah, if it is unclear what I said, please ask me to repeat myself. All right, um, so that fourth bucket is post crossover stuff. Not sure what that workload looks like right now. So if you have um, concerns, questions, ideas, et cetera, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me um, by phone or by email. So I think that we have passed hosting over to Betsy Ann, which means that Betsy Ann now has the ability to put Warren's hand back down. Yeah, wow, nicely done. All right, so Betsy Ann, I will keep an eye on when I see people's hand raise and um, and I will uh, try to, to anticipate when it is that I should interrupt you to, to uh, give the chance for the questioner to jump in. Um, and those of you who are on video, if, if I let it go too long and you think you wanted to ask a question that we are about to move away from, feel free to give me a, a literal wave as well as your virtual wave. I'm gonna try to do my best to sort of read the flow of the presentation that uh, Ledge Council does um, and that a couple of our witnesses do and give folks an opportunity to ask questions, hopefully. Again, if you are ready, uh, you can take it away. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. And I want the screen coming up for you. Yes. All right. Let me get to the right place. So everyone who is not currently um, talking should mute their phone so that, or mute your screen so you can, so we don't hear you grabbing a, a handful of peanuts. Awesome. Go ahead, Betsy. So for the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council, for anybody that wants to follow along on their own um, screens or where I'm, we're accessing this, uh, these docs, it's on the House GovOps webpage under today's date. And the first thing I'm going to pull up is the draft 2.1 strike all amendment that the House Committee on Government Operations last considered as an amendment to S-47. So as a reminder, Big picture, what this strike all would do, this draft 2.1 strike all to S47 would do two main things. First, it would say that only an individual, a PAC or a party can make a contribution to a candidate. And you can find that main language uh, here at the bottom of page six. So notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, only an individual, a PAC, or a party can make a contribution to a candidate. So in effect, that means that non-human entities, such as corporations or labor unions, could not make direct contributions to candidates. But those 
non-human entities could still form their own PAC, which could then make a contribution to a candidate. They're still, they would still be able to make independent expenditures to support a candidate, but of course, independent expenditure means that it's not connected in any way with the candidate. And they can still contribute uh, to PACs and parties. So that is the first main thing that this bill, the strike all would do. The second thing that this would do, if it's okay to move on, is to, and I just don't wanna mess up my screen here. The second thing that this strike all would require is that any PAC name would need to include the name of its connected organization. And that is one other um, slight change that you've made to the bill as passed the Senate, um, is just to change what it means to be a connected organization. It's the corporation, labor organization, public interest group, or other entity that directly or indirectly establishes, administers, or financially supports a, a PAC. And this is the connected organization, if applicable. Um, so the two main changes from the bill as passed the Senate would be to have that contribution limit apply only to candidates. The Senate version would have added apply to both candidates and parties. This committee discussed removing parties from that. Um, and then also just removing from the definition of corporate or connected organization, um, the two or more individuals. That was language that the uh, as past Senate version had that raised some questions about, you know, if it's just two in human beings getting together, you know, what would they call their PAC? Are they, are they going by some informal name? So this would be to remove individuals from the definition of connected organization. That's the high level overview, Madam Chair. I'm gonna see if I can pull up the folks here, see if anybody's raising their hand. I'm not able to tell right now if you are. Oh, I see Rob has a hand up. Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> He's doing cartwheels. <laughs> Rob and then Hal. Unmute yourself. There, can you there hear go. me now? Yes. Okay. Um, one, as far as the naming of the PAC, Betsy Ann, who is going to make the determination that that's an appropriate name and that it's not one that's already taken? Will that come through the Secretary of State's office? Kind of like when you're doing a, a business name, you have to do a corporate search to make sure that those names are available. Well, the language is that it's just the name, the PAC name would have to include the name of the connected organization. And so there's or a clearly recognized abbreviation or acronym by which it is commonly known. And so this doesn't get into that issue. I believe that you're talking about Rep. Claire about not having things that are, um, not having names that are the same. This bill would just use that definition of cor connected organization being the corporation, labor union, public interest group, or other entity that directly or indirectly establishes, administers, or financially supports a PAC. So I would think under that corporation naming requirement that's separate, when a corporation wants to uh, file, register with the Secretary of State, that's where that screening process happens. If there's any sort of um, uh, prohibitions in the, when you register your name as a corporation of prohibiting uh, very similar names, I think that would have already happened at that point because that entity yeah. is operating already as a corporation. And that I have a follow-up question around that as far as um, any corporation. So whether you're like a single member LLC, you would have to develop a PAC. If that LLC is the entity that is directly or indirectly establishing, administering, or financially supporting the PAC, then yes, it would need to include um, that LLC's name in the PAC name. Okay, I'm lowering my hand. Thank you. Excellent. I think we had Hal. Well, um, Rob stole my thunder, so my question was asked. Thank you, Excellent. Rob. We're such a team, Hal. <laughs> you guys are awesome. All right, I see Jim with a hand. Jim, third in line. Go for it. I know, a little slow on the take today. Um, Betsy Ann, I admire your different um, hairdo. I'm just not sure how I can 
swing my head <laughs> the same, you know, with the ponytail. But um, anyhow, this draft, um, as I look at it, the change, as you said, from the Senate was that um, political parties are exempt from accepting corporate contributions. That's correct. Under this House GovOps version, the House okay. Committee on GovOps uh, last time discussed removing political parties from that contribution limitation. So this draft takes them out. It so would in, in the House, um, we have, I don't know, five or so independent candidates or rep representatives. Um, would this um, potentially, uh, arguably make it um, unfair to them. Um, right now, um, presumably they can accept corporate contributions directly on today's law, and they can also receive them from PACs. But with this change, um, those corporate contributions could go to a party, and the parties would have ability to donate or contribute back to their candidates. Um, and the independent might arguably be at a disadvantage here. Well, I haven't thought about it in that way. It, it, on the one hand, all candidates are being treated the same in that all candidates, regardless of party affiliation, would not be able to accept corporate contributions. Um, I hadn't really thought about it from the political party side and whether that puts an independence at a disadvantage. Um, but at least from the candidate side, they are all being treated, they would all be treated the same under this. Um, I would say under your current law, um, political parties can make contributions to candidates and you know, political parties are not making contributions to independent candidates at this point either as far as I'm aware. All right. So I'm not hosting Jim, so you'll need to lower your hand. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. So um, does anybody need more information or more detail on uh, the bill as we were looking at it two weeks ago? Okay. Um, so we have uh, both Will and Eleanor Spotswood from the AG's office with us. Do either of you want to make comment on, um, on the bill as, uh, as we were considering it from a couple of weeks ago? We also have a proposed amendment that we would love to have your comment on. Um, but if either one of you wanted to jump in now, um, please let us know. Madam Chair, this is Will. Hi, Will, go ahead. First, I apologize for not being on the Zoom video with you all. My laptop is having audio issues. Um, I do hope to figure those out so I can see gotcha. you all soon in the future. Uh, that said, real quick, I'm, I'm good with the changes on this particular draft. Um, I will have some comments on the proposed amendment when we get to that. Great, thank you. Uh, Eleanor, go ahead. Yes, uh, Eleanor Spotswood from the Attorney General's office, uh, for the record. Um, our office is also good with these amendments. Um, I would say we strongly support the um, striking that language about individuals from the definition of the connected organization. I think that solves a lot of administra administrability concerns. Um, we don't really take a position on the uh, striking the political parties from the contribution limitation. That's a matter of policy that's up to this committee. Um, and uh, we also, I think, have some thoughts about the next amendment coming up. But in terms of this one, I think we're good. OK. Any other questions, committee, on the draft that we're looking at right now? And we will soon get used to this sort of uncomfortable pause that we make while I make sure that we 
we're giving folks time to find that hand raising button that they that they need to push. Um, so uh, Betsy Ann, if you still have hosting ability, you can um, move over to the proposed amendment. Jim, would you like to introduce this conceptually before we have Betsy Ann go through the words on the page? Sure, I can uh, try to. I had offered, um, I guess it was two weeks ago, an amendment that um, required that if you didn't file, I mean, first of all, let me take a step back. I'm a, just a believer in disclosure and transparency and let the voters decide from there um, as to you know, who the candidate potentially is influenced by, et cetera. Um, and in terms of beefing up our financial disclosure, I had previously offered amendment which required that if a PAC, a party, corporation didn't file the proper disclosures or, or, or a candidate didn't file the proper disclosures that they had to give those contributions back once it was discovered. Um, I did get some pushback from the Attorney General's office as being um, problematic in terms of enforcement. Um, so I have modified that portion of the amendment with a may be required. Uh, and that would be um, up to the I assume the attorney general or a state's attorney, whoever's prosecuting the case or bringing a, a charge. The second piece, um, again, to encourage disclosure, um, right now we have, um, to the best of my knowledge, no penalties for late filings, no filings, um, et cetera. Yet for a number of years, we've had an automatic filing penalty if you're a day late on a lobbyist disclosure. Um, I think on the lobbyist disclosure, it's $25 a day. Um, I put out $100. It's, I'm not, you know, if someone says, well, that's too high. I mean, we can talk about that. But I think at the very least, we should hold ourselves to a higher standard than we do currently. Um, in fact, today we hold ourselves to a we hold ourselves to a lower standard than we do public advocates. Whether that's uh, VPIRG, uh, ABC Corporation, whoever. Um, so I think um, it uh, you know only makes sense to um, have that automatic uh, penalty. And in proposing that, um, I mean, it's first of all and. Um, Will Senning can talk to it. Um, it's his same shop that does it on the lobbyist disclosure in the Secretary of State's office administers that. And I certainly was received the impression um, initially that, um, you know, the Secretary of State's office was probably okay with that. Now that may have changed in the last two weeks, but um, that's that was the impression I got. So that's, that's my motive for putting it Fourth, um, Betsy Ann, I'll turn it back to you if there's anything I missed in that overview. Take it away, Betsy Ann. All right, thank you. Uh, Betsy Ann Rask, for the record, just reiterating what you already said, Representative Harrison, we're looking at draft 4.1 here, uh, Representative Harrison's proposed amendment to S47. It'd be add on to the bill um, and the first section would amend the penalties statute within our campaign finance law. So this penalty statute is in regard to the penalties that could be imposed for a campaign finance violation. Um, and this language would amend the penalty statute um, to say that in addition to the current law penalties, which is a civil penalty of up to $10,000 for each violation, and also there's another uh, provision for um, returning public campaign finance funds um, when there's a violation. But so in addition to those penalties, a person who violates the subchapter four of the campaign finance law, which is about reporting, by failing to report a contribution may 
be required to return that contribution to the contributor. So as Representative Harrison had indicated, this was a discretionary May. It might be something um, that the AGs or state's attorney um, would pursue, um, but it would be a penalty that would have to be imposed um, uh, if it goes through the whole charging process, um, imposed either by a court order or some stipulation as a potential penalty that could be imposed. That was the first part. The second part is in regard to submitting campaign finance reports. And this would amend a different statute in the campaign finance law. This statute that is before me, the 17 BSA 2961, is in regard to the Secretary of State's uh, office's duties in regard to campaign finance law and how people have to submit their reports to the Secretary of State's office. So this would add a new subsection C to this statute to say that any person who is required to file a report with the Secretary of State under the subchapter four reporting subchapter um, shall pay a late reporting fee of $100 for each day the report is late, not to exceed $5,000. And Representative Harrison is correct. Um, the other statute that already provides this is in our lobbying law. Uh, for the record, it's 2 VSA section 264 subsection I, which provides that either a lobbyist lobbying firm or lobbyist employer who fails to uh, file disclosure report um, is subject to a late reporting fee of $25 in that case, um, not to exceed $350. Um, and as I understand it, you'll probably want to hear more from the Director of Elections of how that is administered in practice, um, but it's my understanding that this uh, re late reporting fee is set up through um, the online reporting system that applies. Um, there's an online reporting system for lobbyists, and similarly, there's an online reporting system for campaign finance. Rob, you had your hand up and now it's down. Are you good? Okay. Any questions right now on the words on the page? All right, so uh, Eleanor, if you could share with us um, the AG's perspective on this uh, two-part amendment proposal. Sure, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, so as to the first part, um, we thank Representative Harrison for taking our concerns into consideration and making that a discretionary rather than a mandatory uh, penalty. Um, it just gives us a lot of a lot more flexibility in terms of um, dealing with some of the unsophisticated folks out there who may not understand exactly all of the ins and outs of our uh, campaign finance laws. Um, in terms of the second part, uh, the mandatory late filing fee of $100 a day, um, I do wanna talk for a little bit about uh, some of the differences that we see um, between sophisticated political actors and unsophisticated political actors. Um, and I hope that the uh, director of elections um, will agree uh, you all, I would put in the category of sophisticated political actors. You've been doing this, um, you know, many of you for a while. Um, you've uh, served in the state legislature. You're obviously familiar with our campaign finance laws. We typically don't see a lot of problems with sophisticated political actors failing to file their reports on time. You all are, are pretty good at it. Everyone who knows that they you know, regularly need to file these reports, tend to file them quite regularly. Um, but subchapter four, which is the subchapter that this penalty would apply to, also includes a number of, um, or I should say requires a number of reports from folks that are much less sophisticated uh, in terms of knowing what's required of them politically. Um, and these are the people who we tend to have problems with in terms of filing reports on time because they may not even know that such reports are required. Um, and in this way, it's actually quite a bit unlike lobbying reports, which again, I would put in that bucket of 
fairly sophisticated political actors are the ones that are filing lobbying reports. Um, but I'm going to focus on just two of the reports that are required by Chapter 4 um, to show you what I mean. So subchapter four, I'm looking at um, Title 17, section 2966. And this section requires reports by candidates uh, who do not reach the monetary threshold um, for local election, or sorry, this is general election candidates um, for two or four year county offices who do not raise or spend more than $500. So this is someone who's jumping into a race for sheriff or for assistant judge, um, who decides not to spend any money on their election. And they have to file within 10 days of the general election um, a report with the Secretary of State's office. And Betsy Ann is very helpfully pulling up this, uh, sub this section right here. Um, so you can see what it says. Um, so we can imagine this candidate, maybe this is not a winning strategy for them. They lose the election. 10 days later, they're supposed to file a report with the Secretary of State. We may not even know or be aware that they didn't file this report on time. We may, might get a complaint about this person several months after the election. Already they've passed their 50 day threshold, they've run up a fine of $5,000 and this person didn't even win their election. So this is the highly unsophisticated candidate that we're concerned might get into real trouble with this kind of mandatory penalty. The other subsection I'm gonna focus on um, is also in Title 17, subchapter four, section 2970. This requires uh, reports by really a, a wide range of entities, not just PACs, uh, who spend over $1,000 uh, essentially on any kind of advertising just on a public question. So this is not a PAC that has both raised and spent $1,000. This is any entity that spends over $1,000 on a, advocating on a public question. So we see this come up with folks who don't realize that they're subject to this law um, for things like, you know, you can imagine someone on the PTA who is very fired up about uh, uh, whether or not the school bond is gonna pass. Um, and, you know, maybe this person has a little bit of money, maybe they're, a local store owner or something like that, they end up spending $1,200 uh, trying to advocate for their issue. They don't realize because they're not, again, a sophisticated political actor uh, that they need to file this report um, saying that they've spent this money advocating just on a public question, not on a candidate, uh, not for a party, not for any other issue. It's a local public question. Um, and so uh, this has also come up. And, and these are the kind of folks that I'm afraid would get uh, swept into this sort of mandatory penalty without realizing it. Um, finally, just to address the concern about whether or not penalties exist, um, I'd like to direct the committee to uh, 17, Title 17, Section 2903. Uh, this is a penalties, it's not in subchapter four, it applies to subchapter four. It also applies to subchapters two and three. Uh, and the, these are penalties for any violation essentially of our campaign finance law, subchapters two, three, and four. Um, and this provides penalties for up to $1,000 per violation um, to be imposed uh, essentially after a, a lawsuit is filed, but often imposed by stipulation of the parties. Um, and that's in the event of an enforcement action, either by my office or by the state's attorney's office. Um, so penalties do exist, they are discretionary. Um, and I think that that's for good reason because uh, we do have you know, a wide variety of actors subject to these laws 
And so we need to make sure that we can take into account whether a person even is knowingly violating uh, the laws at issue here. Um, so that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions um, or uh, hear from the Director of Elections. Jim Harrison. Yeah, Eleanor, thank you for uh, putting us in the category of sophisticated. Um, that was quite generous, um, uh, to say the least. <laughs> so, but thank you. Um, so I, I appreciate that you have a wide range of penalties available under current law. Uh, however, I think as we all realize, uh, it's very, very infrequent that they are ever, um, cases are ever brought for a multitude of reasons, one of which may be you don't know about them. Um, in my prior life as an advocate, um, I made darn sure that my reports were filed on time. I set myself reminders. Um, you know, they were in the Secretary of State's office, uh, Will Sennings, uh, division to their credit, I think also used to um, send out reminders um, each uh, period. I don't know if they still do that. Um, in terms of um, sophistication, um, I think I mentioned when we were last meeting that I noticed, um, you know, a significant contribution from progressive voters of America. And so I did a little research on them. Last election cycle, 2018, they contributed over 30,000 to either uh, entities such as the uh, Vermont Progressive Party or individual candidates. Um, they're, I believe, somehow affiliated with Bernie Sanders. It is a PAC, um, but yet there is no Vermont filing on them. So I would think they're a sophisticated, uh, but they're not filing. And it's probably, you know, just ignorant of our law, even though it's based in Burlington, Vermont. Um, but given the, if you had some suggestions on, you know, taking out the so called uh, local or unsophisticated, uh, I would certainly be open to a suggestion you know, i.e. Um, less than uh, $5,000 total expenditures, uh, you know, which might get at that $1,000 uh, public campaign on a local level. Um, if you had some suggestions in that area, I would certainly be open to dividing where the automatic, I like the automatic because it works really well in the lobbying. Um, we can argue about what the amount should be, um, but it, it, it works very well in it. And today, if you don't file notice of mass media report on time, uh, you're putting your opponent at a very much a disadvantage. Um, and there's really no good enforcement mechanism today. So I see another question. Is that Bob Hooper? iPad? Yes. Hey, can you, am I we on? Can, yep, you're on. Okay, so I suppose this is Attorney General's office questions. Uh, both of these changes sort of, uh, for the first one, or actually let me address the second one first. Uh, if my treasurer's computer crashed, I would be ill prepared to pay $100 a day until she got it back up and running. Uh, but also, a couple days ago, we basically took the governor and inserted him into the authority of the Secretary of State. Now we seem to be moving to move the Secretary of State more into the role of the Attorney General uh, with a couple of these things. I don't feel inclined to be very warm to either one of them. Uh, I would ask the Attorney General's office though with section two, is there anything that would prevent um, 
somebody that made a contribution that was unreported and then got the money back from basically saying, that's fine, I'll just give it back to you. You can report it in the next cycle. Uh, this seems like a revolving door potential that has no real impact. Thank you. I'm not sure I actually followed your uh, hypothetical. Can you say that one more time? Uh, I'm all about the hypothetical. Uh, so in the scenario, uh, company X makes a contribution to me. I fail to report it. It gets picked up in that reporting period. The next reporting period is not having been done. I'm uh, instructed to return it uh, because the election is actually over, maybe, um, I'm out of money. So I give the money back somehow, the entity then turns around and gives it back to me. And I then just report it in the next reporting period. Is there anything that would stop that revolving door, which is possible, maybe even probable? Uh, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, English is not my primary language. <laughs> um, I think if we had a sense that um, you were using this return of um, contributions as more of a temporary loan situation, um, we might try to use we might try to ask you to report it differently. Um, I'd actually be interested in hearing from the director of elections uh, on what they might think of that. Um, but I'd have to think about that one. It's certainly not covered in these uh, penalty sections. All right, I see a hand from Marsha. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Marsha. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right, this is uh, for Eleanor. Uh, it might be for Will, but um, how widespread is this problem of people not filing their reports? How many complaints did your office receive? And when you do receive complaints, how egregious are they? Yeah, so um, I can certainly address that. Um, I would say, and I should preface this by saying that I uh, started in this campaign finance related position in 2017, which means I just missed the last big election in 2016 when we had all those contested races. Um, but in these sort of off cycle races that I've seen, I'd say we get, oh, between maybe one and eight uh, complaints per election. This is very back of the napkin um, guessing here. Uh, and I have not seen particularly egregious, for the most part, when we point out the laws, like I said, they're mostly unsophisticated actors who seem to be unaware of the laws, maybe have not filed campaign finance complaints before, or excuse me, have not filed campaign finance reports before um, and are subject to one of the sections that I uh, just went over with you um, about you know, advocating on a public question um, or some such. Uh, and so typically when we point out that they're subject to the law, they immediately file their report. Um, and that tends to be the end of the matter. We don't get a lot of, um, you know, I'm unfamiliar with the situation that Representative Harrison um, pointed out to the committee. Um, I, we certainly didn't get a complaint about that one uh, that I re recall, um, but the ones that I've dealt with, um, again, in these sort of off cycle years have been in my opinion, uh, not egregious, um, but Director Senning may have a different take. Thanks, Eleanor. All right, so let's let's go back to Will, and um, Will, you can either answer 
answer that question directly first, or you can give us your your whole view of the of the proposed amendment and come back to the questions. I can certainly do that. Will Senning, for the record, Director of Elections, and I can answer the question briefly first, and I was going to touch on it, too, when I was just speaking in general, and I'll keep this as quick as possible for everybody. Um, I would say that it is not uncommon for the standard regular disclosure reports to be filed late, <clears throat> whether that's a day or two, five. Um, that's how I'd characterize that, not uncommon. And frankly, it's not uncommon among sitting members of the legislature um, and among new folks uh, who are running for the first time. The One of the issues with quantifying how many people are complying or not is what a couple people have touched on already. You don't know what you don't know in terms of challengers who are running their first campaigns and don't even aren't aware of the requirement to and so don't register with us. We're not going to ever necessarily pick up that those people are out there unless it's reported to us. And that's sort of the last comment on that side, which is that I've said this to you all a number of times. The real enforcement mechanism here is the media and your opponents. And the most common thing is when a report is laid for me to hear from that candidate's opponent to let me know that they haven't filed. Um, but, but I know that I don't hear about a lot of late reports, and my staff does not audit every filing date and produce a report of um, any that are late. We don't have the time or resources during the heat of the campaign season to do so. That's sort of the brief summary. I can take questions in that regard in a minute, but why don't I just quickly give you my, my five-minute thoughts. Um, which are, I have no problem with the first part of the amendment, although I think all of the issues that Ella raised are important to consider. <laughs> I had talked to you all, I guess I, the one issue that I had raised was um, what you would do in the situation where a candidate had expended everything in the campaign account um, and so had nothing to, to return back to the contributor. Um, but with that language being permissive, I think it gives the AGs the flexibility they need to either apply it or not. Regarding the late fees, um, to begin with, of course, whether or not you do it, yes or no, to this is a policy question that is up to you. Um, I can tell you that it's caused significant debate in the past. When we did the overhaul of the campaign finance law about four years ago, there was significant debate about this issue of imposing late fees. For disclosure reports. Um, ultimately, it was not part of that bill after a lot of discussion. I was thinking to myself as I was preparing for this call, I could have just, if I could dig up my notes from four years ago, I would have said the same thing. Um, if you were to decide to go forward as the administrator of elections and as Representative Harrison pointed out, also the director of campaign finance and oversee the lobbying disclosure system and law, I can tell you we could administer this, um, but I want to point out a, a little nuance to that, and I might um, have the AG's office weigh in on something too, um, depending. The, I would support this in, in imposing the late fee structure, or, or could administer it and wouldn't oppose administering it if I would, I would model it the way that the lobbying system is set up, which is to say, and this is the important part, that once your report was late in the online system, you wouldn't be able to file that report late unless you made the payment right there um, at that time through the system. That works really, really well with the lobbying reporting. It's brought our compliance way up, um, and it, it means we really collect the fees that we're entitled to collect. Back in the day when we didn't have the online system and we were chasing fees and chasing cash payments and check payments to our office through the mail, there was a far greater degree of people not paying um, the fee that the office was entitled to. So I would um, design the campaign finance system the same way, and I think I'd be entitled to the way the language is written, since the fees are mandatory, the shall language. and. Um, because they are fees, and that was the point I kind of wanted to ask either Ledge Council or the AG 
AG's office if, if they might want to touch on is the difference between fees and other penalties and whether it is, in fact, the case that as a fee, my office has the authority to enforce it. Um, I think that's the case, but I would, I would want to check on that. If you were to <laughs> ask me to impose some kind of system where the late report could be submitted without paying the late fee and that then my office and or the attorney general's office was chasing down the late fees by check or cash, I would be far less supportive of that idea. Um, however, if it's set up the way I'm talking about setting it up, this is the final point I wanted to make about that, I think that you could end up with the unintended consequence of actually less disclosure because I feel like I would run into a lot of people who were unable to pay those fees or unwilling to and would tell me to forget about my report. Um, you can take it up with the AG's office, which may lead to a lot more of that kind of enforcement that isn't happening now when people have an easy way to correct it without paying. Um, I think I can leave it at that for now, Madam Chair, and take questions. Jim Harrison and then John Gannon. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all for, um, for your comments. Um, um, I, I certainly would agree with, you know, making it automatic um, collection in terms of a late filing like you do with the lobbyist disclosure. That system works really well uh, and there's no reason why this one couldn't as 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 well, um, and again, I would certainly be open to adjusting the penalties um, or the late fees if that helped with your system, and make sure that for 50 bucks you got it in. Um, I, I my my motivation is compliance. Um, it doesn't do anyone any good if a mass media report or financial disclosure isn't filed to after the election when there might've been some critical information um, that would have been publicly available before uh, voting day. Um, and getting back to Eleanor on sophisticated, um, you know, I gave one example um, closer to home the Windsor County Democratic Party gave out over $5,000 last election cycle. They still have not report. Now, I know that, uh, but yet the system, if you look uh, in terms of who contributed, they're all listed individually as contributed because each of the candidates disclosed it. But the party, so you don't know where that money came from, because the party down there, the county party, never disclosed it. I, I, you know, it seems to me someone should know better. And, you know, sure, I didn't file a complaint. Um, you know, what good was it going to do me? It's after the election. I'm still here. Um, but, you know, that's not, I want people to comply. Um, and, and I would welcome the opportunity for some suggestions on how to make this work so that disclosures are put forth in a timely basis as we have in our law. Uh, John Gannon. Um, thank you, thank you, Will, for a um, couple questions, Will. Um, so you said it currently it's not uncommon for uncommon for standard reports to be filed late, is that correct? Will, are you on mute? Mm, I don't know where Will went. I don't see him on here anymore. Oh, did we lose him? Uh oh, yeah. I don't see Will on anymore. Yeah. Well, we'll give him a moment. I'm sure he just got disconnected. Perhaps he was un trying to unmute himself and instead pushed the off button. Can't imagine that ever happening. Jim, I'm really glad to see that you're hydrating today. 
<laughs> yeah, where are you up in the attic or something? <laughs> <laughs> my my our home is uh, is in the barn. Built around an old barn frame. Uh, so um, I'm in the loft right now. The hay, the former hay hay bale place. Well, I'm glad it's not activating your uh, hay fever because everybody would be really nervous if you took to coughing and sneezing today after we were all together. <laughs> right. I don't see Will yet. Does anybody have an email um, link to Will to find out if he's having ongoing technical difficulties. I can send him one. I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Will. I apologize, you guys. I, an incoming call appears to have cut it off, which shouldn't be the case, but I hope it doesn't happen. No worries. Um, so John Gannon has a question for you. Yeah. So I believe you said it's not uncommon for standard reports to be filed late. Is that correct? I did. Okay, so these are the periodic reports that we all have to file as candidates. Yep. Like we had one that was due on March 15th, I believe was the last one. Okay, so but mass media reports aren't periodic reports, correct? Those are filed when you do a mass media activity. Right, they're not regular. They're dependent on you having done something. Right. How would you police those? I mean, I understand how you'd police periodic reports because your assistant could be set up to, to, to reject reports that are filed late unless you pay the fee. But how would you deal with mass media? That's a, that's a good question. I should have touched on it briefly. Um, and it, it also the same question applies to initial registration, right? Because uh, that's floating. That's not on a date. That's right. when you hit a threshold. Um, that same trick we had to figure out in the lobbying system in terms of registration. It's also based on when you put a lobbyist up in the state house and start lobbying. So those reports, the way you, you do those, we would do those require the person filing to identify the date that is the trigger. And then the system looks at whatever the date is that they're filing and figures out whether they're late or not. And so that one relies a little bit on the, you know, the good faith of the filer saying, I did this, I ran this ad at this time, or I made this payment at this time, and I'm reporting it within 24 hours or not. Right. Okay. So those would be more difficult to police, or, or the, I guess the individual filing the report would have to self-police. Right. And, the, and then there's the, just the underlying that they would have to know in the first place to report it. Okay. And, and yep. okay. And, and so you believe you could administer it if, you're, if your system was set up to, to automatically reject late filed reports. Would, would there be a cost to changing your system to do that? There would. I should have hit on that too. Thank you. So there'd be a cost. Not, not significant, but there would be a cost. Yeah. I, you know, pretty, I, I would have to think about that. Or there, you're, you're over $10,000 probably, enough hours to get you over that amount. Okay. All right. Thank you. Committee, are there any other questions, either for Will from the Secretary of State's um, perspective or from Eleanor with an AG's perspective? All right. I see Rob with a hand up. Go ahead, Rob. Um. <clears throat> You know, I, I totally get to where Jim is going with this. Um, I would say that I think the $100 a day is a, a little steep. I could support something more along the lines of the $25 a day, like for the lobbyists. Because um, I will <clears throat> have to confess here among all of us that I am one of those that has filed late in the past. More only because I don't think I always hit the right button. I've actually gone put all the information in and then go back a day or two or maybe even a week later and find out for some reason it didn't send. Um, I, I would rest, you can rest assured it was gonna cost me money per day. I guess I would make sure. Um, the other question I would have would be for Will is if, if we do this, 
it, it doesn't seem, I don't recall getting any sort of a notification or reminder from the Secretary of State's office that I need to do that. It always seems to come from caucus leadership. Is that something we could potentially expect from you folks? Potentially. I, I would have to think about that, Rep. LeClaire. Um, the, the problem is that that ends up with, you know, it goes to somebody's spam folder, and then all of a sudden it's my fault that they didn't get the, the notice email. That's fair. By not having that, it's very clear to everybody that it's their responsibility to do it, whether I remind you or not. Yep. Okay. I'll just put that out there. Thank you. Well, Jim? Yeah, no, just real quickly. I think on the lobbyist disclosure report, um, there is some advance notification, but I think on their website, uh, Will, you have some wording that you're not required to do that. You just do it to help with compliance. That's right. Okay, thank you. All right, committee discussion, questions? Uh, John Gannon. Uh, so, so we'll ask, and I think this is a question for Eleanor, whether the Secretary of State office would have the authority to enforce a fee. Eleanor, can you provide us with some guidance there? Um, that's a good question. It's not one that I have thought about beyond what Will said, which is that if they are collecting it, they would be the first line in terms of making sure that it gets collected. Um, and presumably if it didn't get collected, um, I would imagine it to be sort of their agency action, which then gets referred to us um, as a failure to follow the laws. So I do imagine that they would be the first line in, in terms of collecting that fee. Okay. Jim? I mean. Oh, John, we're back to you, sorry. Um, well, I, I understand Jim's concern about this. Um, you know, I think many of us like Rob are sometimes unsophisticated actors and sometimes we forget to hit a button um, or just forget to file the report on time. And given that we're citizen legislators, um, I am concerned about charging the late fee, uh, especially given the fact that it, there could be a potential cost to the Secretary of State's office, which you know is gonna make this have to go to appropriations and there's a fee. So does that mean it has to go to ways and means? Um, all of a sudden this is becoming a much more complicated bill um, than it was. Am I, am I back on? You are. Okay. Um, maybe this is a question for Eleanor, but um, would you be more comfortable if we mirrored the lobbyist disclosure late fee? Um, it was suggested at $25 a day, which is the same as the lobbyist report um, and up to a similar max. Um, as as to not being a hardship on the so-called unsophisticated actors like the member from Barrytown. Uh, with no comment on the uh, who is and is not a sophisticated actor, um, I think that lowering uh, the amounts all around would be helpful. Um, I'm still not sure, you know, I, I share Director Senning's sense that with late fees, particularly when they accrue without someone knowing that they're accruing. Um, and again, we often get complaints months or years after an election has happened. So, so um, these so-called unsophisticated actors would, um, potentially without knowing it at all, have easily maxed out their uh, fees. And then, you know, when, when we come after them and say, hey, you never filed this report, you didn't know you needed to file, then they're unable to file it without paying whatever that maximum is. Um, so 
just something for the committee to consider, um, whether it's $5,000, which does seem quite steep, or $350, um, maybe for someone who has barely spent that on their local campaign for assistant judge. Um, you know, uh, lower, I think, is, is probably better when you're talking about um, mandatory fees. But, you know, again, it's a, it's a question for the committee to consider. I've got Marsha and then Bob Hooper. Thank you. Um, as it is, we have problems with finding people who will run for public office. I see this as just another obstacle in the way that will prevent people from wanting to run. Um, I might be more open to this if it were for statewide offices only. A lot of times those people have staff, we don't. We're just trying to keep up with all of the work and I know that I have missed my filing dates too. And you know, in reality, I probably had a hundred or two hundred dollars that I had to leave for it. So um, as written, I, I don't think I would support this. Bob Hooper. Uh, I definitely agree with Marcia and I think what John said, uh, I hear our uh, officials basically saying I could, uh, but not I'm really eager to. And it, it, I'm just uncomfortable doing this in this sort of environment for some reason. And I know that's gonna be passing, but um, I cannot support either of these changes as presented and probably as modified down. Any other questions? All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. And so um, I think we need to, uh, Warren maybe wants to ask a question. Are you raising your hand, Warren? Oh, okay. So uh, we have the question before us as um, a, um, an amendment from Jim, uh, half of which we have seen before and uh, half of which is a, a bit newer. So um, I would look for some committee discussion on, uh, on what to do. Jim. Uh, more of a process. Um, I mean, I'm, I guess I would amend this to on the penalty to be the same identical to the lobbyist disclosure late filing. Um, and what I'm hearing from a few members is they're still not happy with that, but um, I firmly believe we should not hold ourselves to a different standard than we do for everybody else. So I would um, like to put forth the amendment and just change that, you know, $25 per day, you know, up to the same maximum for the lobbyist disclosure, which I think I heard was 375. Um, but having said all that, from a process standpoint, um, I, I don't, are, are we allowed to actually vote now on committee or do we have to still work out the kinks with the uh, the online voting? I guess I'm supposed to be on some kind of pilot with that. Um, so I believe that for committee purposes, we are allowed to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, John Gannon. I, I mean, I still remain troubled by the second part uh, of the proposed amendment. I mean, I'm more comfortable with the first part, um, especially given that the attorney general's office seems, you know, satisfied with the, the slight modification to that section. So, I mean, I'd be willing to support that first part of the amendment. Okay, so um, I have Warren with a hand raised and then I will pose the question in a different way. 
Go ahead, Warren. There. Uh, no, I'm, I'm going to support Jim in this. Okay. All right, so I'm hearing that there are differing levels of appetite between one part of the amendment and the and this the other. So, um, Marsha, do you have access to your um, report of action forms for committee action? I do, and I have one ready to go. Well, aren't you the best? <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, Rob has his hand up. Go ahead, Rob. So, uh, did did Jim? Did you change this to so that it will reflect what um, the lobbyists pay as far as the per day, and then uh, total amount, or is that yet to be worked out? Uh, no. Am I on? Yeah. You're on. Uh, I. Um, for purposes of this, I would change the late filing to the, be identical to the current lobbyist disclosure. That would be $25 a day um, up until the, the up to a maximum of 375. And uh, I think I uh, saw it says 350. But whatever, whatever, whatever it is yeah. on the lobbyist, okay. I'm sorry, I, I maybe I have that somewhere. Okay. You're able to see it right now. I pulled up the lobbying law. You should be able to see that, right? Right here. Yep. 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 Um, I would certainly support that language. All right. So, Jim, did you have another question, or were you raising your hand to answer that question? It is three. No, no I was. I was going to. I didn't know if I needed to raise my hand. Sorry. I'm trying. Okay. No, I, I, I'm good. I think he, I gave him the answer. He, um, and if you want to do a um, kind of a hands up, hands down on each section, I'm fine with that too. Marsha. I was just going to say I could support the um, first part of the amendment. So I think it probably makes sense for us to document a little bit more than we would ordinarily, um, just so that we have a record of what we've done um, that people can take a look at. Um, so if it is amenable to the committee, I would suggest that we have Marsha um, call a roll on the first part of the amendment, which is the uh, the part that says that it may be required that the contribution that was um, illegally accepted is returned. And then I will ask Marsha to run a separate roll call on the second part of the amendment being the amended late fee that um, that would follow along with the same penalty levels that uh, that lobbyists do at this point. Does that make sense, committee? All right, so Betsy Ann, you are host right now. Do you know how to give host back to me? I think Andrea is able to. All right, so yeah. um, regardless of who's hosting, I think it would be helpful to unmute all so that we can all hear everyone uh, when Marsha is doing the roll call. So I'll, hopefully we won't have barking dogs or um, squealing grandkids or whatever, but um, Point Marcia, of order, Madam Chair. Yes, Rob. Would it make any sense for us to like raise our hand while we vote? <laughs> that way you have the verbal and the... <laughs> That's very coordinated. Can, can you do that? <laughs> uh, Raise my hand. <laughs> put, raise your right hand. Put your left hand on your favorite holy book. Um, Andrea has her hand up. Um, Madam Chair, you are now the host. Oh, thank you. That's excellent. So there we go. Look at that. Now I have the power to put people's hands back down. That's fun. Um, okay. So I believe that we are all 
Um, let's go unmute all. So mm -hmm. my apologies to Eleanor and um, other folks who are listening at the moment. I've unmuted you all. So just hold tight. Marsha, um, if you wanna go ahead and call the roll on the first half of the Harrison Amendment. All right, do we have a motion for that? Or someone has put forth the motion? I put Jim down. Uh, Jim's proposed the amendment. So we'll, unless somebody else jumps in, we'll give him the... All right. Uh, Gannon. Yeah. It's Miller. Yes. Mowicki. Yes. LeClaire. Yes. Harrison. Yes. Gardner. Yes. Pulasic. Yes. Cooper. Yes. Brownell. Yes. Colston. Yes. Coles Copeland Hansis. Yes. Okay. So that's a unanimous yes. All right. And Jim, do you want to take the motion on the second half as well? Yes, um, and uh, not what's printed here, but $25 for each day. The report is late not to exceed $350. I thought you were going to say $25 for each yes vote. <laughs> Still time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll give Marsha a moment to finish that. Okay, are we ready? I believe so. Okay. Gannon? No. It's Miller. Yes. Rowicki? No. McClare? Yes. Harrison. Yes. Gardner. No. Classic. Yes. Cooper. No. Brownell. No. Colston. No. Copeland Hansis. No. That's seven four. Yes, yes, it is four. Yes, seven no, no Allison. Okay. Um. All right. So we've got one small amendment to make <clears throat> regarding the the possible um, requirement that a contribution be returned. Um, any other committee discussion? Jim? Uh, yes, no, nah, it's not yesterday. Whenever we last spoke on the Senate amendments to the election law, um, Representative Merwicki brought up a, an amendment and I thought we had some conversation uh, in terms of limiting number of candidates of whether we might continue that conversation. And, um, you know, whether it was yesterday or after um, we sent out summaries to our respective caucuses, uh, there was, I think, a lot of concern on both sides of the aisle about the elimination of the petitions having a potential. Uh, field day in terms of filing. If, if there were ever was a year you wanted to run, say, tell your grandchildren you ran for governor or your secretary of state or attorney general, um, this is the year. Uh, so, um, you know, I know on our side, uh, I had to do some serious convincing that overall the package was a good bill and we should support it to get the emergency measures necessary to the governor. Um, but I do think that issue raised some angst as to people putting themselves down on 10 different ballots, which is very confusing 
to the governor. And I understand there is some constitutional potential question raised, but I thought Representative Merwicki tried to, um, you know, put a little bit of um, description in his amendment that might help alleviate some of that. So I'm just, I'm thinking this might be a germane vehicle if we want to have that conversation. And in fact, you know, may actually help the bill. Um, so um, I just throw that out there. So in the absence of someone else jumping in on that, I'm just going to say that um, Owen Merwicki is virtually raising his hand uh, or physically raising his hand, but maybe not put, putting his hand up on. Um, I'm going to suggest that we uh, that we keep the ideas separate. Um, this bill has been in its current form related specifically to the issues around uh, campaign contributions. And uh, I don't believe that we are quite ready to move forward with, um, with a solution that would meet the concerns that I've heard from many people, you know, not just folks around this committee, but folks um, in other committees in, in the House who have been concerned about, um, uh, about sort of the free for all that might happen if there is um, absolutely no uh, hoop you have to jump through or exercise so you have to go through in order to um, sort of demonstrate that you've got a little bit of support to get on a ballot. So I'm gonna suggest that we keep those two separate with a pledge um, from me that we will continue to work on this other issue um, and try to find a way that works uh, between us and the Senate to, uh, to, to put some logical, meaningful equivalent in to getting signatures uh, without putting people's health at risk. I don't see any hands raised. I did see a, a little thumbs up there. So thanks. Uh, Mike Merwicki, you wanna unmute yourself? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate that uh, this is being offered and supported, but um, when we talked about this recently, uh, I was assured that we would have a, a, a full-throated, uh, we'd have the time and a full-throated discussion about that. And uh, I'd still like to have that, but I don't wanna rush this through. So I would, I would agree that it's, it's not the time and to, to stick this on, on this other bill. And uh, I do appreciate the commitment to look at this further, uh, since as we get used to this way of doing business, uh, we're going to have a, a, enough time to, to give it the time and attention that it needs. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I would love to... Um... Uh, I would love to have a discussion if we have time at the end of today, which it's not looking like we're going to because boy, time flies when you're uh, when you're having fun here. Um, and the the extra moment of pause that it takes sometimes to uh, make sure that we are waiting and looking for someone to ask a question does uh, slow down our work a little bit. Um, but when we finish this bill here today, I would like for us to, take a look at the 250th commission uh, bill. Um, and then and if we have time remaining, we certainly, uh, or in our next meeting, we'll come back to the issues around um, some equivalent to petition signatures. Mike. Yeah. Um, I, I hear your, your take on things moving a little slowly and I'm going to, suggest that for now we we move this bill that we've been working on today. So I move to accept, oh, Betsy, help me out with the number. S47 as amended. Yes, please. Just so that we all um, are very clear, the amendment that we have made to what Betsy Ann showed us at the beginning of this committee session is the amendment that, um, leaves open the possibility that a contribution may be uh, required to be returned if it was unlawfully received. 
Um, Betsy Ann, do you want to jump in with anything else on that? Sure, I'll, I'll make it the draft 3.1. So it will be all of your 2.1. And then it's just going to add reparisons proposed amendment um, only in the uh, penalties statute, the amendment to 17 BSA 2903 in regard to the discretionary ability of a penalty to be the requirement to return a contribution that was not recorded. All right, Jim has his hand up. Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, especially for indulging me um, both in committee and today on the video conference. Um, I, I'm going to oppose the bill. I, I think it hides money in the sense that it encourages corporations to give to parties and give to PACs and circle back to the candidates. And arguably it's worse than our present law in terms of um, parties can give unlimited funds to uh, candidates. So whereas today a corporation uh, as well as individuals are limited to the um, to contribution limits for each office, um, this bypasses that. And I think that's not good for transparency. Um, so I will be opposing this bill. Thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in about the bill? John Gannon? Yeah, no, I, I, th I think the bill um, does a, an effort to um, ban um, contributions from corporations and unions and other organizations um, directly to candidates. And I think that's a, a good, important step to take. Um, and I intend to vote in support of the bill. Anyone else want to way in. Rob. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to have to go along with the uh, Jim on this one. I will not be supporting the bill because I think that it makes a process that we feel isn't as transparent as it should be even less transparent. And I know there are some that feel there's too much money in politics, and I can't say that I totally disagree, but let's make this uh, a bit more user-friendly for those who are the unsophisticated um, users of this process. Thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in? Thanks. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> it's hard to know what the appropriate amount of pause is. You know, it's easier when I can look around the room and everybody's going, okay, I'm good. I'm good. Get on with it. Um, okay. So seeing no hands, um, if Marsha is ready to take a roll call on draft 3.1. Are you going to unmute us all, Madam Speaker? Oh, yeah. There. Thank you for reminding me. OK. Are we ready? I believe we are. Gannon. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jets Miller. Yes. Rowicki. Yes. Leclerc. No. Harrison. No. Gardner. Yes. Vlasic. No. Hooper. Yes. Brownell. Yes. Colston. Yes. Copeland Hansis. Yes. That's eight three.
So the motion carries. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so we can probably, um, Betsy Anna, are you, um, are you sticking with us through this last few minutes here? I can. All right. Are you able to pull up the two fiftieth? Sure. And Michael Chernick is with us because I believe he worked on the two fiftieth commission. And I see Bob Hooper with a hand raised. What's up, Bob? Technical sort of thing. I uh, Before I could only see the bill. Now, for some reason, I can only see four people. Is that something that you are doing on your end or is everybody else seeing everybody? I've been toggling around with my screen, just so you know. Um, I've, I have a tile view that lets me see E369, 12 of you. Um, but if you have the ability to, you can change the size of, well, you're on an iPad, so I shouldn't give you advice on this. Um, anybody else on an iPad want to give him a tip on how to get to view the bill? No, I can view the bill when it goes up. It's viewing the people while we're talking mm. that is the issue. So it's okay. Move on. I can. All right. Marsha has a hand up. Um, do we need to assign a reporter for this? Uh, yeah, that, can I interrupt for one second? Go ahead, Peggy. Thanks. I was wondering, has anybody heard about the process? Because I did ask Mike Ferrant this morning, but I haven't heard back. But have we heard anything about the process about getting these bills that are voted on to the clerk's office? Nope. And I think what we'll do is we'll just hold on to this as if we um, needed to ask that question, understanding that it might take us several days or a week or more to understand what that process is looking like. Okay. So at this point, we're not bringing anything to the, the house clerk's office or anything. Okay, great. Thanks. No, I mean, in an ordinary world, when yes. we had a floor session coming up tomorrow, there might be a sense of urgency to, yes. you know, get bills turned into the clerk's office. So they appear in the calendar. I don't know when the next time is that we're going to have floor action. And so I will keep an eye on that. And I will ask the question um, when we get on our next chair's call to understand what things look like uh, moving out of here. Okay, great. Um, okay. So, yeah. JP has a question. Yes, um, just referring back to Rep. Hooper's uh, issue with the iPad. Um, I'm, I believe he was asking that or why he couldn't see everybody. And I had the same thing when I started because first time I used the iPad was in my while while about. Anyway, what I did is I just if you slide bottom the bottom left and right, you'll get everybody, but it's it only lets you see you know four or five at a time. And when you slide it, it will if you get some black screens, which are blank screens, it will fill in eventually with a picture. And so you can see everybody, you just have to slide it back and forth on the iPad. All right, Andrea. Um, Madam Chair. Um, uh, attorney Chernick would like to know if you would unmute him. Oh, that's a great idea. Okay, thank you. Mike, you should be unmuted now. Michael, Mike C, Mike Chernick. I believe you're unmuted. It looks like it. And if you are on a phone, try dialing star six. Still nothing. All right, anybody else have any suggestion on how we can get Mike C up? Oh, I'm not uh, hearing him uh, yet. Madam no. Chair. Yeah. I have a note um, from Tony saying he's um, unmuted in the meeting, but he's muted himself on the call. 
<laughs> so maybe on his computer, he could unmute himself. So Michael Chernick, are you on a computer? I guess we should have tested that at the beginning of the meeting to make sure that we actually had the ability to hear everyone. So there's something going on on Chernick's end that is making this challenging. He said it worked fine this morning. Any luck? Tony is asking him to check his audio connection through chat. Well, this will give you all, all an opportunity to read through the text of this 250th commission. Warren has a hand up. Yes, Warren. I don't have the text here in, in front of me. Is it displayed somehow on, on my iPad that I'm not able to find? Well, I believe we still have Betsy Ann on screen share because I see S-153 in front of me. You may need to shrink the size of the little video tiles of all of us so that you can see the screen share. Hmm. I have a share content thing and it says you can't start screen share while the other participant is sharing. And it allows me to check okay, which is the only thing that I can check. Nonetheless, I, I, recall, I recall the uh, discussion of a, a week or two ago, the folks from Bennington and Representative Morrissey. Uh, I fully intend to support this bill, uh, even if I'm not absolutely 100% on every single word in it. I'm certainly 100% on the concept and the bill was pretty short and straightforward as it was. Uh, I don't know whether we can mm -hmm. get Mike in here or not, but for me, that's not even necessary. I'd be ready to move the bill right now. Well, I appreciate your eagerness. Let's see if we can get a little more troubleshooting possibly done between Mike C and IT and see if we can give him an opportunity. Yeah, Poor man has been listening to our entire <laughs> hour and a half of committee deliberation for a few minutes of presentation time. Um, <laughs> isn't it amazing what a difference? Isn't it amazing what a difference? Madam Chair? Yes. Isn't it amazing what a different Madam Chair? Yeah. I'm going to turn my computer off and just do this by audio. Turn my computer off and just do this by audio. All right. How are we doing, people? I see. We've um, now entered the twilight zone. Yes, we have. That was Merwicky. Okay, so I, um, on my screen, it looks like Chernick is still unmuted, but I'm not hearing him. So um, uh, let's see, what are we looking at for time? We are bumping up against our time block. So I'm going to suggest that we. Um, Uh, do a moment or two of committee discussion here if you would like to about the 250th commission and that we put this on our agenda for our next committee meeting. Um, what I was saying a moment ago is it's amazing to me what a different world we are in at this moment than when we uh, looked at this just uh, uh, seems like just a few days ago. Um, you know, the concept of 
uh, of throwing a party to celebrate our 250th is a little more distant now than it was just a, a short week and a half ago. But we do have to remember that we're coming out of the other end of this social distancing um, at some point. And I think when we do, people are gonna be really ready for a party, <laughs> ready for a celebration of all of the, um, uh, all of the history of our state and the history of our union. And so I really look forward to seeing what this commission can put together. Um, Marsha has her hand up. Has Appropriations uh, confirmed that they um, have approved the amount requested? Um, no, <laughs> no. In fact, that's one of the that's one of the big cautions that um, that we've gotten here um, is that bills that require uh, expenditures are going to be put on the way back burner because honestly, we don't know right now um, how hard this is going to be and how bad it's going to get for us as a state to respond to COVID nineteen and uh, and so. You know, we may want to do, you know, when we get- Madam Chair, can you hear me now? Oh, I can. Because I just phoned in. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you, Michael Chernick. And so, if you like, Madam- Madam Chair, if you like, I'm ha uh, Michael, for the record, Michael Chernick, Legislative Council. I'm happy to go over this bill by phone. All right, so um, we are looking at the bill on a screen share. So why don't you go go ahead and walk us through the bill and um, and then we'll probably push pause there and not try to do um, work that sends us too far into the four o'clock hour. So go right ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. This is a bill that would create a Vermont 250th commission it was introduced last biennium, had some consideration in Senate Gov Ops. It was more Bennington oriented in the last version, and this version has a more statewide orientation. So if you look at section one, it creates a Vermont 250th commission. The membership is spelled out, one person from each of a number of designated counties, including Addison, Bennington, Chittenden, Rutland, Wyndham and Windsor appointed by the governor from a name or names that each county's legislative delegation shall submit. Then one member of the Senate, not from any of the counties listed in subdivision one, another B1, in other words, the counties I just mentioned, appointed by the governor, the remaining counties, the unnamed counties. Then one member of the House, not from any of the counties listed, again from that first subdivision B1, appointed by the speaker then the executive director of the historical society, the state curator or designee. And again, with the historical society director, it may also be the designee, the state historic preservation officer or designee, and one person appointed by the Vermont commission on native American affairs. And one person who is the author of published Vermont history books uh, appointed by the governor and one person appointed by the governor who doesn't fall into any of those categories. As to subsection C, the commission shall plan and sponsor events in advance of and in connection with the 250th anniversary of the state of Vermont, and that also look to the future of the state. That's, 2000, that's 2027, by the way. The commission shall coordinate with the Agency of Education the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, the Department of Tourism and Marketing, and with other state agencies and departments, with federal agencies and departments, with the municipalities of the state, and with national and local public and private sector organizations in this and other states for assistance and support in planning and conducting commemorative sequencentennial activities. The historic preservation officer or designee shall call the first meeting of the commission to occur on and before September 1, 2020. The commission shall select a chair from among its members at the first meeting. A majority of the membership shall constitute a quorum. A member attending remotely shall count towards the quorum and uh, be able to cast a vote. 
and the commission shall not be limited to a specific number of meetings. However, it shall not incur expenses in excess of its appropriated funds. Number six, the commission shall cease to exist on December 31, 2027, again referring to the end of the uh, 250th year. Compensation and reimbursement, it's the standard uh, for attendance in a meeting during adjournment of the General Assembly. A legislative member of the commission shall serve in his or her, when serving in his or her capacity as a legislator, may be compensated pursuant to 2 VSA 406, and other members may be pers- uh, who aren't compensated otherwise by the state may receive the compensation that's allotted pursuant to 32 VSA 1010. And then as passed in the Senate version, there is a $25,000 appropriation for fiscal year 2020. And that is the bill, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Excellent. That was a very quick jog through Thank you very much. Jim Harrison has a question. You're very welcome and sorry for the techie problem. <laughs> no worries. We're all learning. Jim. Yeah, so um, I guess uh, two things. Uh, I mean, first of all, I'm supportive of the, you know, forming a committee and celebrating the 250th. Um, uh, I There's a part in there where it says the first meeting by September 1. Um, I might suggest that that be pushed back um yeah you know maybe it's i don't know december 31st i mean we just don't know unfortunately what the future is and i don't i mean i guess they could meet remotely like we are now but uh, i don't know i just i'm sensitive to that the optics of that the other thing you know quite frankly as madam chair as you said initially um i'm a little concerned about us putting a stamp of approval right now today on a $25,000 bill, which may not seem like a lot, even though knowing that appropriations is going to put it aside, I just, it sort of suggests that we're like removed from reality right now. Um, So I'm just a little sensitive to the optics and that may just be me and I got to get over it. All right. Anybody else uh, want to uh, ask a question about the words on the page or um, or get any other clarifying information? Um, definitely does seem to be very timely to um, to give this some consideration, um, both from the standpoint of um, pushing back the first meeting date to to be what we could consider to be well beyond the current emergency that we're in. And while we hope September 1st will be well beyond that, um, I'm not uh, I'm not really convinced at this moment. Um, so Michael Chernick, I have one other question for you. Um, yes, Madam Chair. You mentioned that the, uh, the flavor of the bill has changed from the last introduction of it to, uh, to this introduction of it in, in that it was more oriented towards Bennington County. That is correct, Madam Chair, because- How did these, yeah, I'm just wondering um, how we have assembled this set of counties um, as opposed to trying to designate this as a statewide celebration. Uh, The particular set of counties that we now have It's reference to counties that existed or the municipalities of those counties existed in 1777. The other counties didn't, uh, their municipalities rather, I should say, not necessarily their counties, but there weren't any organized, for the best of my understanding, any organized municipalities in the unnamed counties in 1777. Hmm. And that is why it was set up the way it was. Okay. Interesting. Any other questions, committee? All right. So I'm going to have us push pause there and um, and come back to this. But do uh, do give some thought to adjustments that you think make sense, uh, given the time and space that we're in. Um, that uh, that we might uh, consider making some changes to this 
uh, if and when we're ready to move it out. Hal has a question. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, given the uncertainty of, of funding in, in the you know, near term, I wonder if it might be uh, uh, a thought to consider for expanding the commission or incorporating the commission of uh, those with fundraising skills and acumen. So that could be another mm. avenue of raising $25,000. Mm. Yeah. That's definitely something to consider. Madam Chair, if I may part now, of course, uh, this was all written in the pre COVID 19 era and the road has changed drastically. But at the time, the reason the money was put in, in part, yes, to underwrite uh, per diems, but that was really a very small piece of it. The real reason was at the time there was a perception that there was going to be federal money available for 250th anniversary activities, and this was meant to be uh, matching funds for that. Hmm. Yes, I recall I that. It's a different era. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hal, back to you. you. Your hand is up. Do you have another question? No, I'm fine. Question? Hi, my turn. Yes. Um, how may it's a good point, uh, something to consider. Um, you know, I I remember the um, the bicentennial commission um, for the state's 200th anniversary in '91, and uh, the state was going through a difficult budget time in the middle of that, um, and the bicentennial commission got their budget cut. And fortunately, uh, they were able to come up with an idea on selling license plates uh, that many of you may have had or may remember, um, much like we did with the uh, Vermont Strong Plates. And uh, we got involved and we were selling them at stores sort of like as a middle person. And I think the state raised you know, I'm going to guess 160,000. Um, it was certainly mm -hmm. enough to pay for some of the things that they were doing. Um, and it, you know, fundraising may be very important. On the other hand, fundraising may be very hard uh, unless the economy turns around. Right. All right. Well, let's um, let's call that a wrap for today, and we will continue to mull over. Um, uh what we would like to do with this bill and i have not yet seen um the the plan for next week for committee times to meet um we were designated these times um on a giant grid this week in order to give it the opportunity to uh, be able to give us support as we um, as we move to virtual committee meetings. So I don't know what next week's schedule looks like, but um, do stay in touch and we'll get you that information as soon as we can. Does anybody have any other questions before we sign off for the day? I have unmuted all of you, or I'm trying to unmute all of you. Some of you are remuted, all right. Great. Well, thank you thank all you. For, for being uh, so patient with this today. If you have any um, tips or suggestions for me as the virtual moderator and doing computer things, as well as trying to call on people, don't hesitate to reach out. I like this setup. Jim and I bookend you on this. Now we get to sit at the head of the table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have well, a great week, everybody. Uh, it's been nice to be with you all. And uh, Andrea has something to say. Madam Chair, I just wanted to remind you that you're the host and you end the meeting. That's right. I have, I have the hosting stick. Can you see it? Yeah. It's right here. <laughs> all right. Wow. I am going to end the meeting, which means that we will end our um, live stream on YouTube and we will
will all disappear from each other's screens. So please be safe. Please stay home um, unless you're going out for some fresh air and then don't touch anything and wash your hands. <laughs> Thank all you, right. Mom. Be well, people. We'll yeah, talk I'm soon. See you later, man. I know. Bye. Bye. Please don't end the meeting. Please just give the hosting back to Andrea. Hey, oh. Tony, can you call me? Oh, gotcha. All right. To what? The Andrea, can you capture um, hosting back for me? Or I yeah. forget how I'm I doing. Can. I got it. Okay. I have Tony it. Oh, Andrea's well, the host now. Yep. Bye, awesome. everyone. Awesome.